This is the eHealth Radio Network, your source for health advice on demand. And now your host, Eric Michaels. Thanks for joining us once again here on the eHealth Radio Network. This is your host, Eric Michaels. eHealth Radio gives you the most current health information, news, and advice featuring some of the leading innovators in healthcare and wellness who are changing health care as we know it. For more eHealth Radio reports, we invite you to visit our main radio channel site at eHealthRadioNetwork.com. Today we're speaking with both Mr. Myron Halubiak, the president and CEO of Sidious Pharmaceuticals, and Mr. Leonard Mazur, chairman of the board at Sidious Pharmaceuticals, a specialty late-stage pharmaceutical company dedicated to the development and commercialization of critical care products with a focus on anti-infectives and cancer care. And gentlemen, thanks for joining us here today on the program. Yeah, glad, glad to be here. Glad to be here also. Thank you for t- giving us the time. Well, it certainly is our honor to do so, and thanks for taking the time to be with us. So, uh, Myron, if you would, for starters, if you would give us an overview of catheter-related bloodstream infections, or known also as CRBSIs, and central venous catheters to kick things off today. Sure. Um, catheter-related bloodstream infections are uh, known as bacteremias, and they really occur when someone has a catheter, a vascular catheter, and it, and it is the cause of the infection. Now, this happens uh, roughly. There, there are 7 million catheters uh, that are installed every year in the United States. And uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 4 to 5 percent, or to be more precise, about 472,000 uh, will cause an infection, a bacteremia. And so uh, an essential venous catheter is one that is uh, positioned uh, in the, in the um, uh, large vessel, uh, primarily the superior vena cava, just outside the heart. And the reason you use the central venous line is when you have long-term need uh, or when the uh, substances that you're administering are somewhat toxic to small veins. So you use a big vein for that. But the long-term need means that once you have a catheter and you need IV infusions that are more than 15, 30 days, you would think about installing a long-term catheter. Now, these people are pretty sick people. So, uh, you know, they they start out with a disease, and then they get this bacteremia. That's what makes this so important. Mr. Halubi, I really appreciate that information. Most helpful. Now, who would you say is most at risk for catheter-related bloodstream infections? Uh, Get into some of that information. Well, I think there's, uh, uh, you know, anybody with a central venous line for sure, but if you want to further define that, uh, it's mostly cancer patients. It's people that are on chemotherapy, uh, particularly intermittent chemotherapy over a long period of time. Uh, additionally, uh, those people are probably neutropenic, which means they're immunocompromised and they, they can catch an infection fairly easily. Uh, Secondly, it would be hemodialysis patients that rely upon a catheter uh, to uh, to, to administer their their therapy. Uh, And then finally, uh, short bowel patients that require parenteral nutrition. Uh, Again, all of these people have long-term needs for IV uh, infusions, and those are the ones that are at greatest risk. Now, even taking that further, if you would, help us out. Give us a brief description of Menelok and how it helps the standard of care in the management of CRBSIs. Get into some of those details. Sure. Um, the problem with these infections is not only does the inside of the catheter get colonized with bacteria or fungi, uh, but in addition to that, the organisms form a, a sludge, a biofilm uh, is the term, and that protects them from antibiotics. So even if you're administering antibiotics to the patient because they have some type of a infection, such as this bacteremia, uh, it doesn't really penetrate. Many of them really do not penetrate the, this uh, sludge, this uh, biofilm. So what we were able to do with Minolock was uh, we had three active substances, uh, which is disodium EDTA, ethanol, and minocycline. All of them are active. And all three work in combination to break down the biofilm and and eradicate the organism. And we were able to show that in a phase two trial at MD Anderson uh, that it worked 100% of the time. So within a five to seven day period, we could completely clean out the catheter. Now, today's standard of care, uh, most of the time, 
is uh, that you take the catheter out, that when the patient gets diagnosed with this catheter-related bloodstream infection, you remove the catheter. And that, that's a surgical procedure because these catheters are usually implanted. The, the uh, catheter itself is tunneled. The tip is at, right outside the heart. The entry point is probably subclavian 70% of the time, sometimes other places. And these are really sick people. So, and they're, they're on the doorstep of uh, you know, mortality. So uh, what you do is remove the uh, catheter. You treat the patient very aggressively with antibiotics during that time. You administer their normal uh, drugs peripherally with regular catheters until such time as the patient is cured of their bacteremia. And then you reinstall a central venous line, and usually in a different place, sometimes down in the femoral area or somewhere else. Now, both of those procedures not only are very uncomfortable, but they're very costly, and, they're, and they uh, come with some adverse events. Our study showed that about 20% of the time you get some type of an adverse event just from manipulating catheters like that. So our uh, big improvement, if you will, is that you don't have to remove the catheter. You leave the catheter in, you treat it, you, put, you infuse it with our solution for uh, a couple of hours a day, for five to seven consecutive days. When you're done with the, uh, with the time that it's dwelling in the catheter, it's called locked, and all locked means is that the fluids are not flowing through the catheter and into the body. So what we do is we lock that solution, and that's by, by just pinching the, uh, the tube at the end with the device. Uh, and then after you're done, you aspirate the, the uh, fluid, discard it, and restart the IV. Uh, any nurse in, in the United States can do this, so it doesn't take any additional training. And again, our phase two trial showed that we were 100% successful in salvaging that catheter. Really do appreciate the insight and information and the coverage so far. This is tremendous today. We're speaking with both Mr. Myron Halubiak, President and CEO of Sidious Pharmaceuticals, and also Mr. Leonard Mazur, Chairman of the Board at Sidious Pharmaceuticals, a specialty late-stage pharmaceutical company dedicated to the development and commercialization of critical care products with a focus on anti-infectives and cancer care. And they both joined us here today on eHealth Radio's Cancer Information and Health News Channels, a part of the eHealth Radio Network. Now, if you would, share a brief description of your Novacite subsidiary and the impact of COVID-19 patients with ARDS, if you would. What is your technology and why is it different here? Sure. Um, as we uh, confronted uh, COVID-19, uh, we recognized that, uh, that there weren't many uh, tools available to uh, clinicians to be able to fight this disease. Uh, we're, we're not heavy into antivirals, so, uh, and a lot of companies are, so there's many companies that are looking for a viral therapy to actually kill the virus. But if you really examine the data, what you'll find out is that what kills a COVID-19 patient is really an acute respiratory condition called the acute respiratory distress syndrome. And what that is, uh, is that the lungs themselves and the, and the uh, little pockets, the little uh, uh, areoles of themselves get destroyed by the virus. So uh, what kills the patient, uh, roughly out of 100% of the patients that get uh, COVID-19, 20% of them will be hospitalized. Of those that are hospitalized, roughly a fourth to a fifth of them, so 5%, roughly 5%, will end up in an ICU. Of those, uh, many of them, roughly 80%, will be uh, put on a ventilator. And if you're on a ventilator, you've got greater than half the chance you'll, you'll die. So the, the, uh, the part of the disease that really kills you is this acute respiratory distress. And there's a syndrome, and it's called ARDS. And what we've found is that certain cells, certain stem cells that, uh, that we can make uh, with our partners uh, is our, uh, work against the, the conditions, the cytokines, the uh, uh, sort of the reaction, the inflammatory reaction uh, that causes ARDS in COVID-19 patients, and it knocks them down. Uh, so what we've been able to do is show, at least in some animals, so we've shown it in sheep now, we've shown, shown and we'll be showing it in mice, and we've already shown it in another model in mice, is that this, these uh, cells really knock down uh, the, uh, the cytokine storm and therefore knock, uh, knock out the thing that kills you if you have COVID-19. 
So this is a uh, product uh, that is uh, allogeneic. When that word means, allogeneic means, is that these are cells from somewhere else. And our cells, what makes them unique and different, is our cells come from pluripotent stem cells that have been processed through a, a technique, a biotechnology technique using uh, messenger RNA. I won't get into all the technical aspects of that, but we have unique cells compared to other manufacturers that are in the same space. Their cells are basically derived from uh, humans themselves, from bone marrow, from fat, from, pluri uh, from uh, uh, a variety of areas. Uh, ours are not derived that way. Ours come from a cell bank that was made from pluripotent stem cells. These are similar to embryonic stem cells, but they don't carry the baggage of having to been derived from embryos, so that's not where our cells come from. Our cells are more synthetic than that. Now, our cells then, uh, we have been able to show that are very potent. Uh, we believe they're going to work great. We've already submitted our preliminary IND, which is an investigational new drug, to the FDA. They've already reviewed it and told us all the steps that we're going to have to take to get this to the human, uh, and we're now pursuing that. Uh, we've started our uh, proof of concept, which is in sheep, uh, and we've been able to demonstrate remarkable things in being able to knock down this ARDS uh, situation in sheep. Uh, we will now be turning to a series of mice studies to prove that our cells don't cause any teratogenicity, which means cause cancer, uh, because these are uh, derived from pluripotent stem cells. Uh, and we, we believe we'll be able to do that, and that's what we're uh, pursuing as we speak. But we hope sometime next year to get this, uh, these cells into humans and really fight the things that's killing the COVID-19 patients. Well, that certainly sounds good to me, and that is certainly a hopeful and positive report and something to look forward to, and we thank you for what you're doing in this space to make this happen. Also, if you would, how is the development of minnow wrap for mastectomies progressing after your collaboration with MD Anderson Cancer Center? Yeah, that, that one's an interesting product. What, what, uh, what the scary story here is that when women get their breasts removed because of cancer, so mastectomy, that somewhere in the neighborhood of 10, 12, 14% of the time, they'll get infected. So these are women that just have gone through this traumatic exercise of having breast, breast tissue removed. They're now dealing with drains. They're dealing with, uh, you know, what, what, how their feelings, and, and, et cetera. And now they get an infection. And this rate is so high. It's unacceptable, frankly. And today what people do to prevent infections in that kind of surgery uh, is you give people a, a, uh, an antibiotic right, right at the time of surgery. You basically rinse out the wound itself with antibiotics, and then you put patients on oral antibiotics for about a week. Even with all that, you still have somewhere in the neighborhood 12 to 14% infections. So what we did with MD Anderson Cancer Center is we worked with their plastic surgeons and their infectious disease experts and invented a film. Uh, a gelatin film that you wrap the tissue expander in. When, when women have a uh, want reconstruction after post-mastectomy, they get a tissue expander put in the pocket, and over a period of time it gets inflated with saline so that the muscle can be built up, so that the tissue can be built up and get ready for a breast implant. And it's, that's the patient that we're talking about. So what we were able to do is maintain antibiotic levels of minocycline and rifampin for a, a month's period of time. And that wrap then gradually dissolves and gets absorbed by the body over a month's period of time. So therefore, we protect the patient at the time of greatest risk, which is when the surgery actually occurs, and during the uh, three or four weeks afterward while they still have drains in. So during that time period, we will have antibiotic levels. Now, we're start, we've, we've started our PIND discussions with FDA. They've given us some great instructions as to what we need to do to get this into, into woman. Uh, and we'll probably have this product ready uh, in, a, in a couple of years. So this is a longer road. Mr. Holubiak, really do appreciate all the information shared here today. And obviously, we also have, as we have mentioned several times, Mr. Leonard Mazur, the chairman of the board at Sidious Pharmaceuticals. And I do have a question for you on the financial front. Tell us and get in some details here. Why did the both of you invest $26.5 million into the company? Sure. So this is Leonard Mazur. So that amount of money is uh, it's obviously a very significant amount. 
it, uh, and it uh, separates us from uh, just about every other public company uh, out there in the market today. Uh, that's not uh, stock options. That's direct investment in the company. Both Myron and myself have gone in side by side with uh, investors in the numerous raises that we've done. And uh, the reason for this is that we have a lot of confidence in our portfolio. Uh, that, that confidence stems from our knowledge, our experience uh, with uh, working with drugs uh, in various pharmaceutical drugs in the past. We both have uh, extensive backgrounds in getting drugs approved, and we have a pretty good idea in terms of uh, minocycline and what it can do in terms of, uh, that's the, uh, the principal ingredient inside Minoloc, which is our lead uh, asset. And at the same time, also, uh, the reason we chose to do this, uh, we're both at this point in our lives that we could do anything we want to do, but uh, the reality of it is that uh, we've come across, we came across an opportunity initially that addressed an unmet medical need. We thought that uh, by getting uh, something approved and into the marketplace that uh, it would benefit uh, uh, human beings that are suffering from uh, these catheter-related bloodstream infections that we had a way forward for them to, to reduce and relieve that suffering. So uh, as a result, uh, that, that's been one of our prime motivators in terms of uh, the amount of money that we put in. And uh, we, uh, we do have a, a, lot of, a lot of confidence in terms of uh, the, the pathway forward in terms of ultimate approval for the drugs. Well, I certainly commend the both of you for that sizable investment and all that you're doing through Sidious Pharmaceuticals and that investment as well. I'm sure listeners would like to know where they can get more information online in all regards and how they could be in contact accordingly. Yeah, SidiousPharma.com will we'll have, uh, and we recently posted a letter to shareholders that give you a status report. And the one thing we may have failed to mention on this call, so I'll mention it now, is that our Minolock product is coming very close to the end. So we're about to, to get to a point where we will uh, stop the studies and we'll submit our NDA, and we hope to have this on the market fairly soon. And that is certainly some more good news on that front. Gentlemen, thanks so much for spending a moment with us here today on ELF Radio. We certainly do appreciate all you're doing in the space. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Anytime, we've been speaking with both Mr. Myron Halubiak, the president and CEO of Sidious Pharmaceuticals, as well as Mr. Leonard Mazur, the chairman of the board of Sidious Pharmaceuticals, a specialty late-stage pharmaceutical company dedicated to the development and commercialization of critical care products with a focus on anti-infectives and cancer care. And for further details, simply visit Sidious Pharma. And again, this has been your host, Eric Michaels, and we do thank you for your continued support of the eHealth Radio Network. Join us again soon for another episode that will help further expand your knowledge on those things that are important to your health and wellness. For more eHealth Radio reports, we invite you to visit our main radio channel site at eHealthRadioNetwork.com. And as always, we do thank you for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the eHealth Radio Network. For more information or to subscribe to this podcast, visit eHealthRadioNetwork.com.